Hi all. I'd like to go over you my game on Thursday Night Just Gone. I was playing for Muswell Hill Chess Club, so that's the Middlesex League, where Muswell Hill have definitely avoided relegation. So it'll be up to other clubs, I think three or four, fighting it out to, to avoid that um, relegation point. Two clubs go down from the first division. Um, so this club was West London Chess Club, and um, I had star guest opponent Alex under Chernev. He's a Russian grandmaster. So isn't that quite ironic, after talking about Russian grandmasters with Kotov examples, that um, I'm actually having to face one. And I really uh, got the impression uh, that he wasn't looking at trees of analysis during the game, but rather just aiming to strategically crush me and gain a huge time advantage on the clock. In fact, I think he only spent about 20 minutes on this game and I was nearly running out of time on the time limit, which was, by the way, 30 moves in an hour and a quarter and then 15 for the remainder of the game. So, he played e4, and I responded with e6, and now he played knight f3, and already I had this twinge of anxiety that I didn't want to go particularly into this line with d5, e5, and f c5 now. I thought that b4 is um, an interesting move. My good friend Alex after the game said, you know, maybe black's got nothing to fear here. If you don't want to accept the gambit, which would you know, end up giving white a nice pawn chain, you can consider the move c4. Now c4 generally um, releases the tension in the position. You don't generally want to play this, but um, here uh, white will not be able to undermine with b3 later, and maybe this is quite annoying for white. Rivka gives 0.13 on a certain depth, so that's an interesting alternative. If, you, if you're concerned about this e5, after c5, b4, maybe just c4 here. Worth looking into. Um, anyway, I decided to try and um, remain in comfortable territory and offer uh, my opponent a Sicilian Sveshnikov if he took up the challenge. I played c5. So I can get into a Sveshnikov by transposition here. If d4, for example, then I could play this and... Um, this um, well anyway it will be this kind of structure which um, w would be interesting maybe that's uh, something else Klashnikov something like that so he didn't play the open Sicilian of course he's further trying to sidestep me he plays c3 so we're back into playing a c3 Sicilian now you remember that I had a good crush uh, for 170 player playing black um, in this in this line, and I played knight f6 in that game, so I thought I'd punt it here. After e5, knight d5, he played bishop c4. And unlike that other game, I think uh, I was more scared of my opponent's tactical opportunities and resources. But in fact, um, here, like in that other game, I think it's quite safe in many variations to leave that knight on d5. If white tries to win a pawn here, um, you know, white's already weakened the light squares, so giving up this light square bishop is not generally a good idea. Ribka, with some concrete variations, highlights there might be some truth to that. For example, if, say, bishop e7 and white decided to go pawn hunting like this, apparently black's better already and doesn't matter about losing the d5 pawn. For example, d6, queen takes. Um, so you'll, you'll notice here there's no problem with the light squared bishop. Um, the only problem is um, being material down. Um, according to Ribka, castles, say castles, knight c6. And the problems are starting to emerge here in the white position. Um, if d4, then black can take on d4. And now if knight takes d4, then d takes e5. And basically, in this kind of position, even though black remains a pawn down, the two bishops offer great compensation. There's also pressure on the b-file, potential threat of bishop b7 here. Also, there's rook b6 to switch the rook across for a kingside attack. So black's actually better here by about 0 
Kunj Ribka. So the whole point of this, showing you this, is I didn't really need to retreat that knight on d5. Anyway, because I may be over the perspective of my opponent at a subconscious level, I was trying not to. I was trying to play the game, but I played knight b6, slightly more passive. It isn't a disaster yet, but what occurs soon is a strategic disaster. Because after bishop b3, um, I play the move c4. Now, when you play the move c4, and white has got the pawn still on b3, then b3 later is going to be potentially annoying. He retreats his bishop, and you know I have this kind of optimism that, yeah, he'll you know play d4 because I thought that's what they play in this kind of position. Not being totally familiar with the theory, so I thought my c4 pawn would would be useful, and um, wouldn't be undermined with b3 necessarily. But um, my opponent uses b3 later to undermine that. But here is the first critical position where I go quite badly wrong. And I looked this up on chessgames.com and also the master collection of letsplaychess.com. And apparently there's a very interesting tactical move. Tactical stroke strategic. It uh, looks a bit of a computer move. But you'll notice that uh, with this faffing around with the light square the bishop, white hasn't moved the d pawn yet. And that means the control of the g5 square is not um, that strong at the moment. It in fact means that you know maybe this g5 is an interesting resource. Before you laugh, I did look it up. You know there are some people that play this with with winning with black, because this bishop can go naturally to g7 to target e5. So if white is using this opening to overprotect the e5 square, then black can use g5 to to kind of pounce on that strategic concept of strangulating black through this overprotection. For those of you who are not aware of Nimzovich, he, he talked about e5 in particular as a strong overprotection point. If white just builds up forces naturally, you know, with moves in principle like this, not bishop f4. But basically this strong point will not only mean that white's, you know, got this space advantage and, and this peering bishop on black's king, uh, and the knight's not on f6 to defend the king's side. It also means that you know, the pieces are very strongly placed, usually in the centre as well. And it's a dark square, so that central um, focus, if the pawn's ever dissolved, it's going to mean dark square pressure later as well. Something to bear in mind, this overprotection strategy. I looked at a few games of Chernev at Hastings, and he's been using this kind of systems with e an e5 pawn wedge and strange knight movements later, like knight e3 with great success, so he's quite comfortable with this kind of position. So anyway, so what happened? Um, I didn't play g5. The other book move seems to be d6, immediately attacking that d6 square. Now what can go wrong here for black? Well, the concern is that this bishop is pointing at the king, but it's not such a, a big deal if you look at the concrete variations, like takes bishop d6, now, say White like, wants to waste time with b3, not you not spend the d, d pawn to undermine c4. So say castles, Ribka's suggestion, now knight a3. I think black might be okay here. a b a b, sorry, c b a b, bishop e7. Does black have to be concerned about that dangerous looking light squared bishop here? Well, let's see, d4, let's take it a little bit further, knight d5. So a nice blockade, provoking white to play c4, but he'd weaken the b4 square. So say white plays knight c4. Now here, I think a common resource in some games that I've looked at as examples is to play g6, simply shutting out this bishop. But um, Ripka suggested it here, but maybe um, it could be left to move, queen c7, wait for white to play queen d3. So that's mate threat can now be parried with g6. And here I think black is okay. It's 0 0.38. It's not that comfortable for black because of this light square bishop is an issue. You know, how is it going to be developed? But um, let's have a look. Bishop d7, knight fe5, b5 here. And now if white really has to take on c6, as Ribka is suggesting, or, or take on d7, then I think the advantage remains at about 0.3. So there's still a bit, of, <clears throat> pardon me, 
There's still a bit of groveling for black to do here. White has a small advantage. Um, so I don't know. Let's, But that's better than the game anyway. The, these two candidate moves, basically, in this position, g5 and d6, are both worth looking at. But earlier, I think you know the whole idea of moving the, the knight to b6 is statistically not as good, in my opinion, as just leaving it there. Try and provoke white to win a pawn, because white has weakened the light squares. So it's like a positional pawn sack to gain the two bishops. And instead of that bishop being bad, it will be a hero later in a lot of variations, if white hasn't gone it. So anyway, so in this seemingly more passive variation, there's the energetic g5, or there's d6. But um, I don't know, I, I think I panics a little. 